makes a lot of sense. So for us, the walkability supports urban density. That's very important for me. Um, and efficient mobility. For me, walking is primarily a, mo uh, a means of moving around and getting to where you want to go. Uh, but also within that, <coughs> you can have more communication in, in the public realm and urban places. And uh, that implies quality of life and health and fitness in the end comes as a side effect. Um, I think it is so important that we have, we're living in an age of urban concentration. I think last year my lecture was all about that. Uh, the post for Network Society, we all need to interact in R&D, marketing, finance, to reprogram continuously the production <laughs> systems which lie outside the city. We can become concentrating in the city, uh, competing globally through uh, various forms of innovation. So this walkable London, I think, would give the, the global market for desirable locations of high uh, value jobs and creative business a competitive edge. So, and that's where we also, that, this is the kind of uh, world we, um, we are also inhabiting. So uh, the proposition I want to offer is a full network of pedestrian lines across all of London rather than a scatter of isolated pedestrian precincts or also what I'm very familiar with from Germany, that you have a small um, historical core pedestrianized, which is usually becomes a kind of um, beautiful shopping mall of sorts with some businesses, and the rest is kind of car-based still. Um, that works for small cities, but I think in London, a large city, uh, I wanted to treat uh, walkability similar to uh, the cycle network and offer a pedestrian network. That would be my proposition, but I will come to this. So first of all, in terms of those isolated spots, which I think should be networked in the end, uh, obviously they are, and they're, they're very important to have a vibrant urbanity. Uh, you can't imagine this without um, pedestrian zones. Uh, we have them all over the place, and some of the uh, hard-won improvements of carving away space for pedestrians have been very, very successful for public realm improvements. But also I want to mention um, the commercial benefits of this become evident. And if you look at private developments around London, starting around the corner here with Westfield, is that they are heavily investing in pedestrian zones. So you have a lot of private uh, squares and uh, privately managed and owned public spaces which seem to go for the pedestrian. And I feel it is a great indication. Same as King's Cross with King's Boulevard, Granary Square, and very large public realms, privately owned and run, shows that this means something, that this is viable, economically uh, viable, and that for me always implies socially viable as well. You can see as well Paddington, so there's, these are large pedestrianized segments. Of course, they're fragments, <coughs> they're isolated. Um, oh, am I going backward? Okay. Um, the other thing which I want to point is, <coughs> is temporary pedestrianizations like in Regent Street have been incredibly successful and driven up footfall and, of course, commercial value. And I was talking to uh, Mr. Cookson, the, the head of um, Crown Estate, who have basically all op uh, properties on Regent Street. He is very much in favor of making such a proposition permanent. So I think there's a lot of indications that pedestrianization could vitalize. Of course, we need to discuss <coughs> and, and see how this has to tie in with public transport strategies to take the cars out and substitute. And uh, so we started to do some visualizations to bring this home, what, it, what this might mean and could mean as permanent pedestrian zones, uh, some of those streets. I think we don't need to go all the way with all uh, city, uh, roads. And an exhibition road is an interesting um, example that you can have shared spaces, that you have prioritized pedestrians but not exclusive pedestrianization uh, in some spaces, that you work like here in Kensington on just increasing sidewalk space and making crossings easier, etc. So these are gradual nudging, nudging on propositions which are very important uh, to take over. What happened also at uh, Oxford Street is the way these crossings are handled and it's more convenient, you can cross diagonally. The way surfaces and architectural codings, semiology of de defining public realm is very important and this design becomes very important for us as designers. But still, in the end, Oxford Street is obviously highly problematic and we're also talking about 
pollution, the fumes are inc incredibly dangerous, as we recently discovered, and uh, becomes a big topic which will drive pedestrianization, I think. So um, we visualized the totally emptying out of oxygen. Of course, it's one of the main policies of the mayor, and it's been already watered down, and we will see what is the final outcome of Oxford Seat. I think it does require full pedestrianization and all the buses out to make that viable, and we try to visualize that for you guys. So I will be looking at uh, some of these fragments and partial improvements uh, kind of scattered around London, and we looked at what are the longer streets, how, how can you really cross town maybe with, with with the pedestrian network. So we looked at what is the longest pedestrian street around the world. They're not that long, actually. But here are a few of them in Istanbul and, and Bulgaria, China, etc. I was a student in Stuttgart, I know this one. And But we have something much larger and much longer. We have these kind of 13.7 kilometers, a tenfold track across the whole of London from west to east, uh, which is the canal, Regent's Canal. And that's a lovely... Um, pedestrian route, which actually has a lot of activation in places alongside, but it's also just a means of transport and incredibly fast and rapid and surprising demand. So if you move along there, you feel telecommunicated across town that you can actually work from Camden to Paddington as, comes as a huge surprise. I lived right at that, at that canal also across the other way, all the way through Shoreditch, because you can undercut all those crossings and don't have to fight traffic all the time. It becomes a real proposition, and a lot of uh, people are now starting to work, walk to work because traffic is, clamped, is is becoming so excessively slow that it's faster for you to cross the center of town. And to make that more viable, that's what we're proposing. And again, we have the other one is the whole um, river walk on the south bank, but now they're building up the north as well. And by the way, these are all private properties which are chained together, and this is actually the Corporation of London who is orchestrating that North River Walk uh, as something which uh, private developers are very happy to participate in as well. The other thing which I thought was rev revelatory uh, was the High Line, and again, it's primarily means of transport, also a nice stroll, but if you walk 10 blocks, either down where you stop at each block, or on the High Line, it makes a huge difference for moving around and it ties in not totally into uh, the big development like, like Hudson Yard and our building is like plugged onto this in, in New York. So this is the High Line right there. And um, it's a great experience and a great accelerator. You have similar projects in France uh, using old railway lines to cross. We, we've seen that in Vienna with bicycle paths. We're actually having a building hovering above such a bicycle path in Vienna. So to covering these old routes uh, is also potentially um, a strategy to run pedestrian pathways along railway lines, next to railway lines, on top of railway lines. You have these elevated lines in the south, and you have these kind of trenches in the north, and they become also green corridors. Um, OK, temporary pedestrianization again, I, I think that will be the route, politically, if you think through it. If you temporarily block and take over, and let the audience get used to it, but also let car traffic get used to it and see that they can actually survive and get around still and is very important. So you have these major uh, closures in, temporary closures in Paris and in New York, the so-called Summer Street, incredibly um, successful and also very lengthy and long. And you don't have to necessarily move all the way, you can plug in from all sides and it becomes an armature of activation. This becomes the example and we did some visualization of Fifth Avenue, or you could imagine every second avenue to be pedestrianized, why not? And so the proposition um, is starting to sit down and sketch which lines one could take, how one would develop that network and locate a certain patches within that. If we zoom in, so this is given and wonderful and a great armature. I would throw the bicycles out, by the way, <laughs> to give that full the pleasure and capacity it should have. Uh, so my criticism of the transport strategy so far with respect to London and the mayor is cycling has been promoted and properly planned out and pedestrian is just the beginning and that's why my, in the consultation process I've put forward these sketches also to the mayor. So I think this is a very important line. We have this one <laughs> and it's, it's 
great success as well and very, very long, crossing all the way east and west. The next one coming in is Oxford Street and there are plans for its extension, New Oxford Street, Theobald's Road, Clerkenwell Road, uh, I know this very well, all of it's shorted and further. Uh, the, the next segment after Oxford Street is called the London Boulevard and the ideas of moving um, their promoters who want to turn this into a pedestrian priority boulevard. Now I'm saying go all the way and make <coughs> it a full-on pedestrian access. And then we need to start to find some north-south, of course, axes and cross, cross it, and we can discuss that. <coughs> Picking up, obviously, a lot of underground stations, trying to pick up some of the railway lines you come in so you don't have to switch anymore. You just go, come in with the rail as a commuter, from King's Cross, and then you, you walk the rest. I think that will be viable, and we come to this at the end. So we're trying to f identify these lines, and um, maybe further east-west, so we're building up a network. And these lines need to work with, and I will come detail this out later, with the high streets, of course. Uh, you can't, otherwise you have lots of cul-de-sacs. The high streets also is where all the shops, retail, restaurants have accumulated, where the, where the uh, underground stations are plugged in. So we need to pick out some of the high streets and pedestrianize them. That's the proposition. And also they keep running, running, running. They go all the way out and you can extend that. And of course there are enough of those that there's enough left for traffic and we pick those which are less big and more human scale and develop that. I think that's a viable proposition. And then you have secondary connections which don't run all the way through but create a kind of grid network which allows you to go um, reach everywhere in the centre of London on these paths. And then I'm saying within that we start to emerge already patches which could be more or less fully pedestrianised. Doesn't mean that sometimes cars come through, go through of course as emergency vehicles and delivery uh, at odd hours. That's the way we can learn the lessons from all the German pedestrian cities or other English cities, the way deliveries and so on man managed in totally pedestrian centers. But we have in London, it's big, it has several of these historic centers. There's the West End, it has of course the city, which we should fully pedestrianize. I mean, uh, I was talking to Ian Simpson, <coughs> who is uh, leading the efforts for the London Corporation. He is kind of pedestrianized in his mind, bank, a major, major political effort. but. He just managed to keep, for a certain period of time, cars traffic out, but the buses are still pouring through. <laughs> and there's enough of those to, to don't destroy any feeling of a pedestrian zone. Yes, you see more people crossing, but also because the cars come back before 7 and after, I think 8, the whole infrastructure of lights and traffic signs and curbs and tarmacs kills the whole sensibility, which we would need. But I think it was still a great effort and a great signal that the city could be um, one of those historic centers which become fully pedestrianized. And then maybe we, we grow more of those and we build it up as we shift and concentrate more residences in the city and we can more and more rely on up the densified underground network, etc., etc., cycling and walking. And why not walk a lot of that when you come in from to the edges of this? I mean, people are healthy and fit, late in life, and it's actually they should stay healthy and fit, they must be walking. Uh, they're not going to do that if... <coughs> they need to be nudged on, as well. it's a bit of a nudging theory here. So, um, we looked at, of course, the most those patches, and where is trade located, of course, this connects up. Um, there's also a value proposition, there's the idea of underground station and the accessibility of all those spots in these fully pedestrianized, you just walk a, uh, a little bit and we use, uh, as a benchmark, we can use airports. Uh, we just designed a Beijing airport um, with a large terminal without trains, fully walkable, and the, the rule of thumb there is 650 meter you can uh, find acceptable. And, um, and I think that with that rule, you can fully cover actually London with, with, with um, central London with, with underground station at the moment. Um, the big challenge is bus routes. 
uh, which deliver a lot. Uh, in central London, as you know, uh, don't ever step into a bus because you're going to be locked in traffic mm -hmm. and wish, and then you're kind of prisoner of the bus driver. <laughs> I've experienced this too many times, so I will, I will leave the bus before I enter central London. Um, so there's problems there, of course, ex as well as with the, with the horrendous diesel fumes, etc. But we need to obviously uh, <coughs> compete and fight away from the bu some bus, like bus routes and turn them into pedestrian. And then the bus will have still the majority of other routes to go by. Traffic accidents, air quality is a big thing. I mean, I'm walking along uh, London all the time and we instinctively use uh, secondary layers to move around, but then you actually have to walk <coughs> more. You're kind of winding around and you have to know London. So there's a real problem if you don't pedestrianize some of those lines. And yes, you can walk along these highly traffic roads, but it's incredibly uh, unhealthy and unpleasant. And also sidewalks start to become jammed up and you're slowed down there, as well as standing at traffic lights all the time. So this is a big topic. Air quality, I mean, it's, it's, it's a scandal. And I know people who are suing governments around Europe, in particular also the London government that they're not meeting any standards they signed up to in European treaties. Uh, and that's a very important point. Okay, let's just look at this one more time, uh, and I will go into a bit of a detail on some of those lines. So the main thing is we have these two lines already existing, and these were the two new propositions we would have to fight for, this kind of new crossing. Two axes would do a lot to get going, and maybe it starts with a temporary condition uh, on weekends, in the summer, to get used to it, to, to test what the problems are. And we, I've presented this to an organization called Living Streets, and they looked at this for a long time, for many decades. And they looked at cases where there was temporary road closures due to road works, etc., and what the experiences are, and where is traffic going, and they found out traffic is disappearing. So there isn't the clogging up necessarily around this, and maybe people make other decisions. And, and uh, so it becomes kind of self-regulating. So every, any model one can try to model, and we are starting to model this, uh, it's, you know, in the end it's very unpredictable how people uh, cope with this, but they do cope, and in the end life goes on maybe in a better way. So, so this is the line I want to, uh, so the, the Oxford Street line has already been looked at and proposed. It uh, comes to London Boulevard, just extend it further. This is the line I've kind of picked out as my first trajectory, just to show you how one makes this decision. So you pick <coughs> one and you have others still going. Um, and then you pick up things like pedestrian routes, like this is picking up on the Millennium Bridge, in fact. Um, picking up destinations which have a lot of uh, uh, des destinations which, which tie in well with, with an ex pedestrian experience, like Tate, St. Paul's, Barbican, Sadler's Wells. And the trace though, I looked at it a little bit, uh, how you move through this, and that these corridors could become fully pedestrian corridors. Picking up the Barbican, uh, the Museum of London, the future <coughs> concert hall, which will be located, so it's gonna be great access as a so-called cultural mile also tying in with, with respect to the Corporation of London. Looking at these roads have been very, very stable and long-lasting. Um, and, and they have already a lot of activation, but they're unpleasant, they're not beautiful. They're, the, the, so these, these, these links which we're wishing for will not happen because it's not inviting enough to move through and up there. And I think this is going then further up Gosford Road. We have our own uh, gallery actually accidentally on that spot. And so it continues up uh, through past that as well, past the Angel, Upper Street, and again picking up more of the underground stations. Um, Angel and Highbury Islington. Here we could swing again, you swing in the second layer along the, uh, that little pedestrian side street which exists. Uh, already with lots of shops, you can pick that up if the trajectory is clear, and then you move up into Upper Street. And Upper Street is, of course, a no-brainer. Hundreds of restaurants, and but very fast, far too small sidewalks, 
and the benefit will be kind of huge. And, and now, that these are snapshots which I made on a, on a Saturday. It's just a wall of buses. So to think that just pedestrian normal car traffic to be banned isn't enough. The buses are just filling those roads with, with fumes and with noise. It's an incredible noise, continuously humming noise there, which is, which is terrible. So I want this. And this. And this could go on for miles. And you can have a jog, you can have a marathon, you can walk on a Sunday, or you come in and out of this. Uh, you take the train down and walk for a while. And then it goes further, and you can see again there is uh, several lines one <coughs> could, could be maintained for all the traffic coming through. I'm not, um, it's not an ideological battle, it's, it's a pragmatic proposal. But if you look at something like Blackstock Road, it's actually a very narrow street, uh, filled with buses like, up, like Upper Street. So it would be the, the perfect pick for this. And again, instead of the roads would take this, I'm just cutting through highway fields, um, the parks, and then lead, take over Blackstock Road, leading to Finsbury Park, and on and on. So this would, I think it's a viable proposition. You could get a lot of backing for Upper Street, all the residents, all the um, uh, restaurants, and so on, and I think for Blackstock Road equally. And again, you pick up uh, the underground stations, and this is what it is now. It is already a, a high street. It's relatively narrow, um, and therefore perfect for pedestrian scale, these kind of high streets. Um, another topic, finally, to, fi to finish off, um, some of these big cuts, how we can ameliorate them. Uh, if you look at Bloomsbury and the uh, University of London and then Houston and across, these textures, these fabrics have been kind of sliced apart by these big barriers. And there one could look at what happened in Boston. You don't have to totally cover everything, but one will have to kind of help that and make that a partial um, <coughs> inhabitable zone rather than kind of an uninhabitable. And still let, of course, the primary traffic flow through. So, um, And again, there's the assemblers, which there, there, there is traffic and pedestrian. They can coincide in such a large um, uh, space and make that a more inhabitable zone and that the city continues. So again, the final vision seems quite um, out there and, and kick-ass, if you like, and, and shocking. But uh, we're just starting with two lines. And I think we can bring them in, as I said, weekends first, etc. So I think it becomes a tangible opposition. Just need somebody to champion it. Not me. I mean, I'm, I'm just somebody who's an agent provocateur. Uh, somebody more serious in the political domain, and I think this could be happening. And I've put this forward to the, uh, as, a, in, as a consultation response to the mayor's draft for transport strategy with a kind of thesis. And with that, I offer the thesis to you for debate. Fantastic. Thank you.